Hello all, and welcome to what I believe to be the biggest episode yet in this Don't Hug Me I'm Scared theory series. If you haven't watched the rest of the series yet, I would recommend doing that because this episode builds on all of those to answer some of our biggest questions yet. What does the book mean? What is up the stairs? And what is up with Leslie? For how long I've kept talking about this book, it's time to finally answer everything. So let's just jump right in. This book is the biggest shock factor in this show. Leslie, the person that we see with the most control in the show so far, gives this book to Yellow Guy to help him understand his reality. Right when we are about to learn what this book means, it's shredded. It seems that we would never actually understand this book or figure out what it means, but as long as I'm here, there's always a solution. There are a lot of questions we need to answer about this book. Our first question is, who wrote this book? Then we need to figure out why Leslie even has this book. And then we finally need to figure out what this book says. Let's start with our first question of who wrote the book. When looking at this, we have three possible choices. One, it was Leslie. This seems like a choice that would be in everyone's list as she's the one holding the book. Two, it was Yellow Guy as he is working with the symbols on the napkin before we even see them in the book. Three, it was a third party and came from whoever's up the stairs. Let's begin with some facts that we know that could definitely help us out. Number one, we know for sure that Yellow Guy is familiar with these symbols in one way or another. We see him writing these on a napkin and understanding what the book says, and we see that the entire book is written in this language when we can see the shredded remains. This will be a point for Yellow Guy. Oh, what a goal! One of the greats! Whew, what a game. These next pieces of evidence are starting to dig in deep. We see Leslie pull out this book from her coat, and when she does, she blows off all the dust that is lined the top. This seems quite strange for Leslie. We see that everything in her attic is so neat and tidy, even asking Yellow Guy to help her tidy up with the smallest amount of mess. The only mess she has in the attic is the yarn and furniture lying around, which is all condensed to this small area on top of her piano. It would seem very strange for someone who cares about their personal items and stuff she uses frequently to have a layer of dust coating her book. I think we can deduce that she hasn't read this book, or if she has, she hasn't touched it in a very long time. The next thing we should look at is Yellow Guy's familiarity with all of these symbols around him. Once he becomes smart again, he almost immediately starts making up this spatial distribution based puzzle. Oh, and I actually made up a little spatial distribution based puzzle of my own, see? While before, we could have just argued that he's trying to decipher these symbols, but he confirms here that he in fact came up with these symbols, and based on our dive into how Yellow Guy's brain works in episode 2, he has to regain these connections in his brain, so he's still not quite sure what they mean, hence why he's experimenting again. This is a huge point towards Yellow Guy as he literally confirms that he created these symbols. This creates a huge complication, however. If Yellow Guy created these symbols, how could he possibly write this book before he received it? Well, we've already previously analyzed that Yellow Guy is very aware of the upstairs, and we've concluded that it's because he's been there before. He's had ample opportunity to write this book before his batteries run out, and once he gets them replaced, he doesn't fully understand the book because he completely lost these connections. We could even say that Yellow Guy does eventually make all of these connections again and understand the book, as we never see him open it both in the attic or in the kitchen before he starts trying to tell his friends about it. However, we don't have a lot of real evidence for this, so this is all just speculation. We do, however, have a lot more evidence for Yellow Guy writing this book. There are two actions that Yellow Guy does in the attic that are a huge deal. The first big thing is that Leslie gives Yellow Guy this book without him even asking for it, and Yellow Guy's even confused why she hands him this book. You wanted this, didn't you? Did I? The next thing is that Leslie laughs a lot towards Yellow Guy's questions, as if the answer should be obvious and that he should already know them, but the fact that he doesn't is funny to her. That's a good question. What's the answer? <laughs> but there is still one more huge thing. Leslie says a few very specific words after yelling at Yellow Guy that I want you to pay attention to. Gosh, you still can't see the funny side. Leslie says that Yellow Guy still can't see the funny side. 
Not that he just can't see the funny side, but that he still can't see the funny side. Now, we could say that she has just interacted with the dolls enough to be able to make this general statement about his pessimism, but definitely not. While Yellow Guy is the most tortured of the group, he is the least pessimistic. In Jobs, he goes along with everything they do in such a cheery nature, while it's Duck who is taking this seriously. In Family, Yellow and Red Guy are going along with this family, and once again, it's Duck who doesn't want to hear any of it. In Transportation, Duck and Yellow Guy are trying to be civil, follow directions, and stay at home, while Red Guy is the one who wants to break free, and during the beginning of Episode 6, Yellow Guy is so into everything that they are doing that he doesn't even care that his guitar is not real. He's just strumming away and having the time of his life. If Leslie were to make this general statement about anyone here, it should be directed towards Duck, who at least once in every episode didn't want to be a part of the lesson, or Red Guy, who always seems to want to break free. Leslie cannot make such a general statement about the character that follows almost everything she does. She has to have interacted with him previously, which fits perfectly with the rest of our evidence that we've gathered here in episode 2. We not only figured out who wrote this book, but how this book could possibly have been written in this timeline. There is one new issue to address, however. How does Leslie have this book? This question is rough. And to answer it, we first have to figure out what this book says, which is even rougher. Let's start by figuring out what we know. First of all, there are stairs above Leslie, so we can write down that Leslie is not the highest level in this universe. If we created a feudal pyramid for the show, we can 100% at most put her at the second from the top, knowing that there was at least one thing above her. Now, let's take a look at Leslie herself. We know that she doesn't have full control of these puppets, and she even looks puppet-like with her colored stitches. We can also see that her room is in the dollhouse, as if to indicate that she is also under the influence of somebody, just like our main cast of characters. Now we need to start looking at some things that are less in our face. Let's take a look again at the David scene in episode 5, the ending of episode 5, and the first time we meet her in episode 6. Let's start with the David scene. Oh, careful. <laughs> careful now. When watching the end of this clip, we can hear Leslie yelling for Yellow Guy to watch where he's going before screaming. We can hear her still feeling strongly about the accident and not quite having gotten over it. Let's write that down and start looking at the ending of episode 5. She ends this episode by saying this. Journeys made and lessons learned. You may feel like you're alone, but no matter how much the wheels turn, the journey always ends up back at home. Some things in her sentence feel a little weird. For one, she says, you may feel like you're alone, which was never in the question. They never felt like they were inherently alone, as they were a group of friends. The only person alone here is Leslie. This feels less like a commentary on the characters, and more like a commentary on her. Let's write that down and move on to the first time we meet her. She says some very interesting things the first time we meet her, which we need to analyze very closely. First things first, let's play the clip. Batteries can be replaced, but some things stay the same. No matter how we twist and turn, we're still dancing in chains. Let's start with the first thing she says. Batteries can be replaced, but some things stay the same. The first part of this sentence is very straightforward, as she is commenting on what just happened with Yellow Guy. But the second half is very interesting. She says that some things stay the same. She is telling us that she has experience in this attic and with these characters. She has clearly been there for a decent stretch of time. The next sentence is even deeper. She says that, no matter how much we twist and turn, we are still dancing in chains. This sentence is loaded with information. In the first part of her sentence, she says, no matter how we twist and turn. She indicates that there are multiple times that things twist and turn. That means the direction has changed multiple times, which can tell us that Leslie is not happy with her current situation. And we already know that she's been there for a long time. The last thing she says is, we're still dancing in chains. Not they are still dancing in chains, we are still dancing in chains. She is putting herself in the same group as the rest of the cast, showing us that she is also being controlled. 
We now know that Leslie has been there for a long time and that she is being controlled, but wishes to break free. We figured out that Leslie does not want to be here, but then why is she here? We could theorize that she is some sort of security guard type character that just guards the door to the upstairs, but that seems a little far-fetched. We could say that maybe in a grieving state, she went to somebody that could help fund this project of hers and it just got so out of hand that she basically became under the control of somebody else, just like her creations, but this is just speculation and we don't have enough evidence to truly understand the why yet. But the thing is, we don't need to know why she is there to understand the book. We know that Leslie is under the influence of somebody, but who is she being quote unquote controlled by? To answer this question, let's go back to talking about how Leslie isn't the highest level in this universe. We need to figure out what could be above her. What could be up these stairs? It's finally time. After all of these episodes saying that I'm going to talk about these actors that we see in the show, it's finally time to talk about them. We see some weird things pop up during this show, but the weirdest by far has to be the actual actors. We can see them in two different episodes and hear them in another. The times that we physically see the actors are here during the rewind in episode 4 and here in the big boys room in episode 6. However, we do hear them in episode 5 during the end credits. Let's start with episode 5. Choo 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 says a train. Choo moo moo says a cat. Because this moment is so funny, I didn't even realize that we were actually listening to these actors during this segment. We hear a new voice for this episode, completely messing up a song, while we hear somebody else laughing in the background. In episode 4, we can see that Warren the Wor- Eagle! Eagle. Sorry. When Warren the Eagle is rewinding these episodes, we can actually see the actors playing these puppets, and we can also see what looks to be Becky herself right here. How could we know it's Becky just from her back? Well, her clothes are identical to an image she posted on Instagram while on the set of DHMIS. Finally, the most important moment, episode six. We can see here that there are two actors dressed up as the blackboard and they definitely make it known that they can see Yellow Guy and Yellow Guy can see them. We actively see people who have more control over the set than Leslie does as they are physically controlling these characters and we can even see them knowing about Clay Hill in the back. I will go over everything Clay Hill and Wakey Wakey in a future video, so for right now, let's just focus on these actors. So we have now seen people that have much more control than Leslie has ever had, so we can easily put these actors in the staircase above Leslie. We could even speculate that the actual creators of the show would be at the top of this feudal pyramid as we can see Becky right here, but that's not as important as learning who is up these stairs. We are off to a wonderful start, but we have still not answered our big question. What does the book say? Well, now with all these pieces that we've gathered, we can start putting everything together. Geez, now that I'm looking at this blackboard, we might not have enough room for everything. You know what? Let's head somewhere where we can get an even bigger blackboard. So let's move to the bigger boys room. Perfect. Let's start writing everything we know. We know that Yellow Guy has been in the attic before. We know that Yellow Guy wrote the book. We know that Leslie is being controlled. We know that Leslie wants to break free. And we know that the upstairs leads to the actors. Things are almost starting to fall into place in a very coherent manner. There is still one more thing we should look at though. Let's head back to episode 6. We already know that Yellow Guy has been up here, but Leslie says a few more very interesting things in this entire sequence. First off, Leslie says something to Yellow Guy that feels like she shouldn't know. When Leslie is talking to Yellow Guy for the first time by the piano, she says this. I tell you what, you help me tidy things up around here, and I'll help you. After asking Yellow Guy to help her tidy up, she says she'll help him, but Yellow Guy never asked for her help. She already knew what he was looking for. The next clip, after they finish cleaning, she says this. You wanted this, didn't you? Did I? <laughs> Yellow Guy never said that he wanted anything or was looking for something, but based on the way she phrases the sentence, it would seem as if Yellow Guy did ask. But if he did, Yellow Guy would not have responded in such a confused manner. Right after Yellow Guy asks this, Leslie laughs as if it was obvious to her that he did ask. Finally, we started mentioning this before but never fully discussed it, 
but Leslie never reads the book and instead hands it over to Yellow Guy as if he was the only one who could read it. If she was able to read the book, then why hasn't she? We now have our new information. We know for a fact that somehow Leslie is following some sort of very specific directions that are not being currently told to her. These things that she is doing are oddly specific to the situation and she keeps laughing as if Yellow Guy should know what's happening. But if Yellow Guy was already up there with Leslie and Leslie understands what's happening right now and Leslie has the book that Yellow Guy wrote, these dots completely come together. The old smart yellow guy and Leslie were coming up with a plan. A plan for what you may ask? A plan to break the cycle. A plan to break free from these chains as Leslie so wishes to do. A reality that yellow guy is completely aware of. So how do they scheme to break free from this cycle? Yellow guy creates a language. A dialect that only he can understand as we see with the untouched book being given to Yellow Guy in a oddly specific way with no former requests from this new smart Yellow Guy. And through this, we can fully understand what the contents of the book are and it's something we all thought before but didn't have all this evidence to prove it, but this book is the way to escape. The way for the entire cast and Leslie to finally leave. How do we know it involves the entire cast? Because not only does Leslie push Yellow Guy to go to his friends and tell him about the contents of the book, and not only do we see Yellow Guy trying to communicate this book to them, but we see key features of all of these characters on the book cover. This is how Leslie is holding on to the book after it was written by Yellow Guy. This is why she is oddly doing these specific actions that are not asked of her, and this is what the book means. As involved and seemingly conclusive as all of this was, it wasn't. We have answered a lot of the questions, but have created a lot more as well. First off, if Yellow Guy wrote the book and wanted to bring his friends with him, why did he shred the book at the end? And our next big question, if Yellow Guy was aware of everything that was going on above them, why didn't he try to communicate this with the main cast previously, considering that even if he was reset, he would still retain this knowledge? Well, let's start with our first question. Why would Yellow Guy shred this book? A common theory is that Yellow Guy is shredding the book because he is choosing imprisonment over losing his friends. The idea behind this is based on the interaction that Smart Yellow Guy has with Dumb Yellow Guy in the mirror. Have we gone wrong? I don't think so. This doesn't feel wrong. At least it doesn't hurt to think anymore. But they seem upset with us. Maybe they're not in charge of us anymore. Maybe they never were. We can see that Yellow Guy is somewhat scared of losing his friends, so when he finally is reunited with them, he shreds the book to keep their friendship. However, I do not think this is the case. We see in episode 6 that Yellow Guy is super adamant on exploring and learning the status of his world and his place within it. He continues climbing these stairs with him being unsatisfied at each new peak. Finally, when he gets to the top of the steps, he receives the book and heads back down, not noticing the final flight of stairs. But there's no possible way this could have happened. This smart yellow guy was able to create an experiment with a new subset of symbols that aren't quite numbers or letters in the matter of minutes after becoming smart. He experiments with these ideographs minutes after changing his batteries. He instantly understands what should and shouldn't be on the electric bill. He instantly understands the concept of insurance and he is smart enough to know that all of these teachers are spewing absolute nonsense. He is so aware of his surroundings that he is able to see the actual actors controlling these characters. You cannot tell me that someone so smart and so aware of his surroundings would somehow miss this final flight of steps. No way. He has always and will always care for his friends. He goes back down with this new book in hand just so he can leave here with them, which was the original plan, hence why all of their names and personal identifiers are spread throughout the cover. 
There would be absolutely no way that after coming this far and sacrificing the knowledge of the final flight of steps just to bring his friends into reality that he would shred this book because he would find it an easier way out. If Yellow Guy wanted an easier way out, he would have changed his batteries immediately, but he chose to continue on and go back to bring his friends with him. But if he was so adamant about bringing his friends with him to this true reality, why did he shred the book? Well, to answer this question, we must go back to the actors in episode 4. Here, we can see each of the characters being controlled in one way or another. However, Yellow Guy's knowledge somewhat remains through the batteries and wires connected to his brain, which influences some of his actions, as we can see him remembering David's death in Episode 5, and how he continues upward in Episode 6 without the control of the actors who are currently controlling the other characters. When Yellow Guy has his batteries fully charged, he is in full control of his own actions. When he reaches the attic, we can hear Leslie say this. Can't I stay here with you? Oh no, you don't belong up here. Leslie tells Yellow Guy to go back down because he doesn't belong up there. For some reason, he is not allowed to be up there, but Leslie is not kicking him out. She is saying this as if it's a suggestion for both of their sakes. We already know that Yellow Guy and Leslie were scheming to break free, which would make an understandable reason for why Yellow Guy shouldn't be up there to make sure that the actors don't catch on to their plan. But sadly, the actors have already caught on, as seen in the big boy's room. Now we're starting to get somewhere. We have figured out that the more that Yellow Guy's batteries are charged, the more in control he is, and that Yellow Guy and Leslie's scheme must be kept secret and hidden from the actors, or else everything they worked for is completely useless, but the actors have already caught on. This is great, but it still doesn't help us answer our question. Why does he shred the book? Well, let's start looking at Red Guy and Duck's adventure in this episode. Specifically though, let's look at Elect Tracy. When the batteries are swapped, Elect Tracy gets the old ones. These batteries are not able to support the house's electricity, as we see in this clip. Oh dear! Hmm, maybe your blood sugar is low. These batteries are slowly failing, until finally, the batteries die and the power goes completely out, as Red Guy and Duck have used up the last bit of charge that these batteries were holding. Now, when Yellow Guy comes back downstairs, Duck swaps the batteries from Electracy into Yellow Guy before they are reset. Yellow Guy now has his old batteries back, but the problem is, they are completely dead. This is why Yellow Guy instantly has zero memory of the book again, even if he's powered by electricity, because right now, there is absolutely no current going through him. But we've seen and established that the more charge his batteries hold, the more in control Yellow Guy truly is. But now, his batteries are completely dead. Yellow Guy is not in control at all and is fully at the will of the actors. And we know for sure that the actors are at least somewhat aware of this little scheme that Yellow Guy and Leslie have cooked up based on them watching him go upstairs to where he shouldn't be so they take charge. The actors, now fully in control of Yellow Guy, shred this book to make sure that Yellow Guy and Leslie can never go through with their scheme to escape their grasp. We are on a roll, and let's keep it going. Let's answer our final question. If Yellow Guy was so adamant about leaving with his friends, why did he not tell them the truth through every new reboot? Well, he tried. We can see that these characters are aware of each other's names in this language that we know Yellow Guy came up with. Yellow Guy was aware that his batteries were slowly dying, so to try and make sure he could remember, he placed post-its and the symbols throughout the house of their names, which was why it was the only thing that they all knew and remembered in the first five episodes. And this Yellow Guy even tried to remind himself on the whiteboard. It doesn't tell him to remember the password, it tells him to remember it. The password was a part of the symbols, but he needed to remember more than that. He needed to remember the entire language, but was only able to remember this much until his batteries died a little too much, 
and everyone else was reset, and Red Guy and Duck didn't remember their own names, and Yellow Guy was forced to re-establish these connections. This is how Yellow Guy wrote the book. This is what the book says. This is how Yellow Guy and Leslie tried to escape this nightmare, and this is why Yellow Guy shredded the book. Woo! This video has taken it completely out of me. This has been the longest video yet, and the hardest to edit. If you've made it this far, please consider subscribing and ringing that bell icon because we have two more episodes to go. And if you are enjoying these so far, you are going to want to know when those are up. In the next episode, we will talk about the idea of death and discuss a little bit about Roy and what it could mean for him in the long run. We will also be talking about the symbols a tad bit more, and in the final video, unless we get more information and I have to make more videos, we will discuss the entire DHMIS timeline. A quick warning about the timeline, we will not be going into when each episode takes place because these episodes are not meant to be linear. They are all meant to be subjects contained in their own episode, but all with the same overarching themes, plots, and ideas, so we can only put the big key events into this timeline, so it will not contain each specific episode. With that being said, that timeline video will still discuss a lot, so get ready for it. One final thing before I end this video, I am just insanely grateful to all of you. We somehow hit 10,000 subscribers, which is an insane number to me. I know I always thank you guys at the end of every episode, but I mean it. I literally can't be here without you guys because you are all the people that subscribe to and support me. So I truly want to thank you all for 10k, and I'll catch you in the next one.